This is Splice. Welcome to Splice Pink. I'm Alan Suna, co-founder at Splice Media. And I'm Rishad, the other co-founder. So Pink is where we have quick conversations with people across the global media ecosystem. So it's from media startup founders and journalists and funders to all the tech, data, and design folks. That also includes game developers. In today's episode, we're talking with Simon Vincent, the content strategist of Playlog, which is a game development services team based in Singapore. The website says it all began with a board game. Simon, tell us why and how Playlog happened. Hi, uh, it's great being here. So Playlog started out when we began working on Flyway. It's a board game on bird migration and conservation. So that that game is basically a kind of, it's based on the East Asian, Australasian flyway. So we wanted to focus on migratory birds in Asia. So there are all of these uh, very important threats that birds are facing and a lot of ecological messages that we wanted to bring across. So we had worked with BirdLife International, who is our knowledge partner. We were doing a, we did a brochure for them. So it was just, you know, what are threats migratory birds are facing? And then, you know, we, we enjoyed this partnership and we wanted to do something new and fun and something, you know, perhaps that you can have more broad uh, appeal for people. So we started thinking of this board game idea and then it took off really and it just became bigger and bigger actually. So I don't want to get bogged down in the details, but right now we are playing a lot of creations, but we were uh, from Tuba, which was a design and editorial consultancy. So through this board game, we kind of transformed in a lot of different ways. And a lot of that had to do with getting on Kickstarter as well. So when we put the board game out there and then uh, we saw, oh, okay, you know, people are interested in this game. And, you know, game design is something that we really liked and enjoyed. And there was so much potential to explore this medium to tell stories in a different way. So we were like, okay. From there, we started thinking deeply about, you know, what, what do you want to do as a game company? And that's where Playlog came about. Playlog, where you want to bring play and dialogue together. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in how you explain what Playlog is, right? So when your friends ask you, or when your parents ask you, what do you do, son? How do you explain this? It's, on the one hand, it sounds like you are a game developer. On the other hand, you, to me at least, you are a media design firm. Yes, so, so part of the reason for that is, so uh, when we were exploring game, game design especially and game developers in general, we found that a lot of game designers, they, they were very, they had all the expertise in designing games, you know, the game mechanics, how do we get this game design working? How, how does the game work? But they didn't have, they didn't always have the illustration capabilities and the graphic design and the branding. So that's why we saw, okay, Tuber, we have this, you know, experience over the years, many years, you know, working with clients on their publications and, you know, we were good at putting out content. And then we saw this kind of, this opportunity where, okay, we can fill this gap for game designers. And yeah, so, so we kind of, we, we started this out from tabletop game development, but we saw that, you know, there was a lot of overlap with what, what you need to do with, to put out uh, media content. And so, yeah, we're kind of open that way. We're, we're into tabletop game, tabletop game mechanics, but we want to help people with, you know, if you have a campaign and you want to gamify it, because gamification is so big right now, and even like books and comics, they're all kind of having like game elements to it. So, yeah, we, we thought that's something we can help with. So, yeah, that's where that's the, the media part comes in, I guess. When, when you look at, and what other people are doing in this space for, for you know, gamification and whatnot. What have you seen that really stood out as a, as a fundamental shift in the way we think about content and games? I think one of the, one of the companies that, that, one of the initiatives that really, that really made an impact to me, I haven't tried it out myself, but I saw the videos and I saw the website. There's this company called game to grow So what they do is they use Dungeons and Dragons to do... Uh, lessons for children and they use it as a form of therapy so yeah so you know so it is so from what i remember so it's like okay so you have a kid right now he's having trouble opening up 
So you create a character and you create some challenges where you get the kid to inhibit the, to kind of inhabit the role and then put some challenges maybe along the way maybe you have to defeat some orc or whatever and you have to speak out and yeah you get the kid to do that so for me you know this was this was amazing right because you know you're bringing something something that's so old right dungeons and dragons right but you put it in a zoom context and you can do it you know on zoom and yeah that was yeah that was very exciting for me and i i, I like that you know and use games to kind of bring people together for maybe a bigger cause i mean i'm fine with just having fun that's that's great but you know games there is this social component to it and how you can kind of get people to maybe think deeper or do something that you know they don't even realize is something bigger so yeah that was something that was quite interesting to me and i also found that especially now with covid situation right everybody is going through all of this digital transformation and stuff right now at least in the board game scene there's uh, a lot of wonder about how we are going to adapt to this and so a lot of people have been using uh, this platform called table tokia so that's basically an open platform where you go there and you upload your artwork and you can let people play the game if you want Uh, we use that actually for our play testing sessions because this nobody expected covid and this happened just when you we were about to go to kickstarter and play testing is so important so what we did was uploaded on table topia and we got play testers to do it it's not always easy because because it's a open platform the 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 functions you are using it's it's not always fixed it's not always catered to your game mechanics and stuff like that but it was good just to get things rolling So I wanted to you know take what you were saying forward you said that you saw a bit of a gap in the market that you could offer services that other perhaps other game developers weren't offering and that takes me to storytelling because I mean if you don't have a good story your game is not going to work right and you know we work with other kinds of storytellers and you know in the media so have you guys worked with journalists or news media organizations yet is that part of your plans not yet but we definitely be open to that and uh, first cuz i come from a journalist background right and the way i approached the collaboration with bird life was kind of from that sensibility so you know you know you're working with a story you you know you go to your source or whatever your partner and you interview them you get as much out of them as possible right even just the feelings or what is it like to bird and stuff you know birding you know what what makes people so enthusiastic about it and why are they so yeah why do they go out there for hours you know together and you know do those birding competition and so the person that we work with closely is Dr. Yong Ding Lee so he is this very well established bird scientist you know he's working a lot on bird conservation so he was working very closely with our, our creative director who's a bird photographer so she was already kind of uh, and involved in the community so what we would do at least for our game design process so we discussed with birdlife international okay so what what is the game going to be about so we wanted to focus on the east asian australasian flyway which is this huge part of the world which extends from russia in the north all the way to new zealand in the south so when you're thinking about that okay so birds in this region asia they are not usually featured in many games or even in media then you're thinking this map okay it seems like you should use this map as the game board and okay birds have different destinations okay why not why not this game be a route building game so essentially in this game you are placing links completing migratory routes to save birds but the bigger story behind that is that when you are placing this you are learning the the ferry peter goes from this destination to this destination and along the way we have these threats of foul play and that's where the conservation element comes in oh okay if birds actually hit into buildings and yeah and all, there are all of these different uh, ecological threats so we we got all of that through a lot of con- conversations with dingley and everything was kind of vetted with him and making sure we balance the fun with the science yeah i mean it strikes me that that birding is like the original open world game right you're collecting data you're comparing it and you're all bound by this big mission yeah exactly and actually if you think about gamification it's in so many things that you don't even realize right even if you are going to the bubble tea shop and you are getting your stamps 
you are go- wait, waiting for the fifth or tenth bubble tea, and that's a game in itself. So absolutely, yeah. So I I like to understand more about about the company and 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 how and how you work with clients, right? So so what what does a a, a standard pitch sound like when you go out and you're pitching for someone's campaign? Let's say you know if you were if you were working on the test trace vaccinate campaign, how would you think about this? Oh wow! I I think first thing the first, most important thing to figure out first is what medium they want it to be on because that would determine. A lot of things. So I think right now there's some TikTok game. It's like you swipe. I think it's like Fruit Ninja thing. I, I think it was developed by kind of which government agency. So yeah, I mean that's I mean that's fine. You you swiping and stuff, and it fits for TikTok because you know you want something that's you know maybe a little quirky and easy to play. But I guess if it's a larger campaign and maybe there's a specific messages you want to bring across. Uh, it could be something online, like an online game. Yeah, so I, I think it really depends what they want. Is it a long campaign or is it just a game? There are even games that are just done via emails, which uh, can be quite effective. So tell, yeah. tell us more about that. That that sounds really cool. Email games. How does that oh, work? Okay, so there's this game I played. It was launched on Kickstarter. It was called Wait For Me. And it's it's an RPG game. And it's called a journaling RPG game. And essentially, every day you get a prompt and you respond to it. So it's a writing game, but it's pretty introspective. You get as much as you give to this game. And this game, wait for me, is a kind of time travel game where you're writing. You have a journal. So, so this is the cool thing. You have to have a journal, something you write in. And this is what you are sending to your past self. And the, the cool gamifying part here is that they'll actually ask you to take physical things to paste there, to send as proof to your past self. So you would actually reach into your wallet, for instance, to take out a receipt with the date on it. And you're like, hey, uh, past self, you know, and then you write a note there. And this is just, you know, an email, email game. I mean, you can now go and download the whole PDF and do it yourself. But during the campaign, it's yeah. You, uh, as soon as the campaign's over, she started sending uh, weekly emails, I think, or is it uh, daily emails? Yes, it's something very simple but effective. And I think a lot of people got uh, a lot of people uh, connected to the game because of the pandemic, because there was this. Since I, I don't know, I don't know if uh, it, it was the same for you guys, but everybody was kind of like searching for community. They were feeling alone, and yeah, this whole introspective part. So I think she created a game partly inspired by that too, and yeah, that was yeah. I I I I, I quite enjoyed that game. Social gaming is a whole uh, another can of worms, right? Pretty amazing, you know. So. Again, you know, I'm coming back to our core audience, you know, a lot of media folks and a lot of within that, a lot of news media folks. So what if I had an article, you know, on, say, how many tax dollars it took for a billionaire to go to space? You know, how could you help me with gamifying that into a little like rocket ship game? What would you what would the onboarding process be if I wanted to launch this? So I can't give like a specific game design path right now, but I would imagine a lot of it would be the way uh, data science, data journalism stories being rolled out now. There's there's a lot of potential there for gamifying because you have to click and then there's a path you want people to go towards. And I would imagine it would be cool if you can actually create multiple uh, pathways in a kind of story. I mean, actually, I, I, I have thought about this. I, I'm, I'm just trying to work out how exactly it works. So, you know, you know, whatever, if, when you're learning about journalism, there's always different angles and stuff. What do you lead with, right? I was just imagining, if you had one story with different leads and, and it all goes into different places, I don't know how exactly that would work, but it would be an interesting experiment. Yeah, yeah, these, these are things that excite me, but... You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there are a lot of possibilities. This is just me uh, talking on the top of my head. But yeah, I have thought about this. I've even thought about Kickstarter. So, you know, when you go to Kickstarter, there are a lot of um, 
there are projects where you are funding for something maybe long term. Okay, there's this project, but you know later maybe I'll see what I'm going to do as a company and stuff like that. But perhaps like you could even just start a magazine with like, okay, this is for a w- one year or one month, three months or whatever. This is the content you want to do, and you know I tell you every all the content we want, and this is how much funding I need, and then you just create something beautiful or magical for that what that period. And you know you get all the best contributors, and you know you tell people you know these are the people you want to hire, and yeah, and then you you kickstart, and then you fund it. And you see already people people are interested in it because I I think the sustainability thing is something a lot of people talk about, but perhaps something you know short term but concentrated could be interesting. And then later you see if you want to start a company or what. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Your your enthusiasm is really quite quite infectious here. It's really exciting to see. What so looking back at your career, right? And and you've written you know freelance pieces across across the region. You've done a lot of work on that side. What do you wish you knew about gamification principles that you know that that you could have done back then? Or you wish you could go back into your past life and apply gamification. I I don't know whether it was. For me, it was a lot about the community engagement part that I felt was missing for me as a journalist. Yeah, so so I, I, so it, it's funny how you get lessons not from the media sometimes uh, or like news outlets. So when I went to Kickstarter, like you really get the sense how much is at stake because you know you're asking quite a, a lot out of people, right? So you know you're putting all the product there, and you know you you do make sure you show how credible you are. And how invested you are in people's trust, right? But they are basically committing to you with money, right? Before they actually get the product, that's that's a big responsibility, right there. And you know, you have to make sure that you connect your community as authentically as possible, and you know, as much as you can. So when I went to Kickstarter, so I did a lot of research. I you know I went to see a lot of people's work. Why, why, why is this Kickstarter campaign connecting people? And, Wow, the creator is really going out there talking to people, and they they are posting the updates、uh, as regularly as possible. And also, Kickstarter taught me about the fact that you don't have to get everything right as long as you make sure that you 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 know you are you're honest and you you keep people、uh, informed. So you know, right now with the pandemic and stuff, there, there's a lot of problem with、uh, shipping you know, costs、uh, rising, but. Kickstarter backers, they 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 kind of they understand this problem, as long as you make sure you inform them ahead of time. So we we try to do that as as much as possible. So you know, you know, shipping updates, you know. So I I I have been thinking about that. If if I had this kind of sensibility from early on, how how would I have approached launching my book? Perhaps. So like before for my book, ah,、uh, the Nay Sales Club. I only planned the website. I I don't know if I should be revealing this, but it's fine because you know this is all learning experience. The website is so important, right? But I was just so caught up with the book, and then I didn't think of、uh, you know how 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 am I going to make sure this book connects with people, right? And the website is so important. I did it in one month. I think it's all right. But now we you know with the experience I have, I I'd be planning that you know a lot more and. Thinking about you know how I can really make sure that I connect with people. I, I haven't thought about it in a great detail, but how would a publicity campaign for a book through a gamified medium be? I don't know. Maybe even a quiz. Maybe you can do a kind of email game campaign thing. Yeah. So I would definitely not go about marketing the same way、uh, because I I think even when doing freelance stories, you you finish the story and you send it to publisher and. You kind of detach sometimes from you know how the story later gets received, right? Which is sometimes understandable because you know I'm saying all this, but you know journalists have a hard job as well. Because、uh, I, 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 I've been thinking about this that you know we, we're sharing a lot about the many ways you can do journalism better, but there's also so many things to do sometimes. And yeah, how how do we kind of balance that? And yeah, I, I don't know. It's something I'm, I've been thinking more and more about. But I mean, this is one of the conversations that Alan and I have all the time. You know, I mean, in fact, you know, arguably, this is one of the conversations that that well, you know, launched Splice is how do we straddle those worlds of you know startup and journalism and media, and how do we make them bring them together so we can make them make them work better, right? And all the things you're saying about the lessons that you wanted to learn, 
as an early, you know, in your early career as a journalist, are like, you know, fail fast, fail cheap. You're saying build in public, which is something that you learn from Kickstarter. You know, you work with community, be responsive, you know, incentivize or gamify what, what you're doing. And you don't, it doesn't have to be uh, fantastic and finished. It has to be a product that appeals to people. And we're, I mean, we're taking all these lessons away from you uh, because you straddle those worlds completely. Yes, I, I remember when I told my friends that I'm starting with my colleagues a game company and they're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, Because there's this shift, right? But for me, there is quite a lot of things that overlap. I mean, I'm still writing content and, you know, you know, in the end, what, what is the story for but to connect with readers? I'm still doing all of that and, you know, right, running a newsletter, you know, making sure your website content and all the copywriting is good. It's just, you know, I, in, a, in a different industry. And for me, it's precisely this, this startup experience, right? How many journalists get to, you know, start a company? So for me, I, I wanted to go through this whole experience. So you, you, you might not think that it's important, but finding out, oh, okay, this is what it means to run a business. And okay, if so for us, if we are doing shipping, I don't know whether, whether it's an online product or what, how, how do you make sure the prices and, you know, your costs, and all of that, the amount of work you put in, uh, there's something at the end of it, uh, and the time you spend on it, it's yeah, it's a whole you know other way of thinking. And for me, that excites me, and I find that's especially important now, uh, especially if you are a freelancer, actually, because you know all of these things, you know, you have to know it. So the freelancer mentality and the startup mentality, there's a lot of overlap. I find. And do you think that's teachable? You know, it, it would be cool, you know, to be able to bring that, those two mentalities together and perhaps, you know, teach more freelance journalists part of what they already basically know is intuitive knowledge, right? How to be a startup, how to be a successful startup. Yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, <laughs> uh, things like, you know, making sure as a freelance journalist, you still have a website for people to go where your portfolio is. That's so important. You might, you, I, I was pushing it always, you know, thinking I will do it another day. But that's so important. You need a calling card, you know, things like that. Uh, if you get it right from the start, it <laughs> makes your life so much easier. Because, yeah, it's great to be a great writer. That's important, you know. You're making sure your content is good. But there's so many uh, writers out there. How are you going to stand out and make sure, you know, you uh, you know are you are the first one people approach or people want to pick during a pitch? And that means marketing yourself. You know, you've got to market yourself. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, I have not really kind of like put it down in like principles. I find for me at least it was just going through different experiences so yeah so for me they start this play lot with a new company and you know I, I know i'm getting a lot out of it you know whether it comes to content creation or kind of community engagement and i, and I know this will be useful so yeah i, I don't know just putting yourself out, out for new experiences would help i guess <laughs> i i love that we that we both have the same uh song sheet here right uh rishad is nodding his head off <laughs> because we agree so much with everything that, that you're saying here if i could push you to to have you know list some of these principles may, maybe not not a list of principles but what would be the number one principle that that people people in the media industry need to apply when launching new products hmm I, I I think I saw this in your newsletter, but it was something uh, that really. No, nope, uh, you can't attribute to us. Oh no 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 no! It's not it's not uh, a specific uh, point, but it's actually a way of thinking. I I don't I don't think you all put it in these words, but the fact that you as a journalist, whatever you are, up news outlet or what, you are still just a content creator like everybody. I found this very important because whatever industry you are in, I find if you are creating content, that's important to know because for me at least i found that i think journalism is kind of going through a lot of uh, changes in many ways right and there's if you stick with the whole idea that you know we, we're journalists are special and there's this special place and stuff like that and then and then you there's this kind of i don't know elitist or what 
but but you kind of skewed that way. You don't really see your content as I, I still need to connect with people. I, I still need to make sure it's not just oh just because I'm a great journalist, you know, people are going to connect with me. Especially when you're a new startup, you you cannot assume any of these things. It might be different if you're a legacy media outlet. Fine, you know, you can just produce content. And, you know, yeah, there's a big enough architecture there to push your content out and help you with it. But if you are starting out something new and you want to set, set yourself apart, you can't work with those assumptions at all. Yeah, I don't know. If, yeah, I find that's, I don't know whether that's some, yeah, that, that's for me very key. It's more of a kind of way of looking at what you do and, I don't know, keeping yourself grounded, but also realistic. Uh, you know, making sure that you know what's at stake and yeah, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow as well, right? Because, you know, you, you, if you're a journalism student, you've gone through whatever causes and stuff, you've gone, through, you've done all of this technical knowledge and then you're out in the working world and then you realize, I, I just can't, it's just not enough to write a story. It's harsh, but it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the honesty and, and just the realism and practicality of, of, of all this knowledge you've got, man. This is fantastic. We're going to leave it here because this is a conversation that could go on for a lot longer. <laughs> Simon Vincent, a Playlog, a game development services company based in Singapore. This is a wrap for, for this episode of Spice Pink. If you like this podcast and you want to get more, please subscribe. Better yet, share this with someone who is also interested in, in transforming the media landscape. Get in touch. We're on splicemedia.com. We will catch you in the next one. <laughs>